So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the uh, normal uh, monthly meeting of the Libertarian Alliance, which is on the uh, third um, Tuesday of the month. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, Kia, who's going to give us a talk on medieval thought. And evil political thoughts. So, something like that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, David. Um, I'm going to have to apologise, first of all, because I always change the titles because I, I can never really decide what I'm going to say in advance and it's, it's, it's always very difficult, uh, even then, if i decided to say something in advance, I'd probably change it at the very last minute. But um, I, so I originally decided I was going to talk about something like law... No, um, I mean, anarchy, I think, was it? Law and anarchy, yeah. was it? Law in medieval England? Or? Yeah, that did. That's anarchy was in the title anyway. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So, but then I decided medieval political... And then Jan Lester gets in touch with David and says, is there a more specifically libertarian element to this? And, yeah. Um, I hope there is. That's the answer. Scholastic libertarian. Yes, indeed. Um, so well, yeah. Live up to it. I shall have a go. <laughs> um, so most people, when they think about scholasticism and libertarianism, tend to think about the second scholastics. Suarez, Vittoria, Molina, Domingo de Soto, and so on, um, which, I mean, they're, they're fantastic writers, um, but I thought what I'd do, because my main interests are um, high to late medieval um, thought at the moment, uh, I would look at some thought from that period, which seems to me to foreshadow some of the, the developments in uh, counter-reformation thought. One of the problems for um, the, the development of something like libertarianism for much of the Middle Ages um, was the enormous influence of Plato. Another equally probably dangerous um, influence was the concept of Christendom. Of course, if you think in terms of big uh, states, in a sense, um, you can't think in terms of small states and individuals. Um, and that's, that's something that I think has probably been uh, done to death if Plato hasn't as well. But I thought I'd look at the sort of the reintroduction of Aristotle um, from the, the high medieval period onwards um, because it seems to me that the, the changes in the ways of thinking that um, came about as a result of the reintroduction of Aristotle um, have um, some pretty obvious, I mean, you can hopefully create your own relevance when you hear things that, um, that sound sort of libertarian. Um, of course, the, the, the main figure that you have to talk a bit about when you're talking about the reintroduction of um, Aristotle into the West is Aquinas. And Aquinas was absolutely drenched in Aristotle. Um, and what he, in many ways, seemed to be doing was uh, essentially baptizing and confirming Aristotle into the Catholic Church. Um, and he seemed to be um, creating some kind of hybrid between St. Augustine and Aristotle. So, and unsurprisingly, he sometimes failed to appreciate um, St. Augustine on his own terms him being the, the main medieval um, theologian that everyone would look back to, um, mainly because Augustine was very slippery and rhetorical, much too, much, much too slippery and rhetorical for a scholastic. Um, and when Aquinas used a word, um, it would mean one thing only so far as the Latin allows, whereas Augustine would revel in ambiguity. However, the reintroduction of Aristotle into the West required a reconciliation of him with Christian orthodoxy. And as Walter Ullman uh, put it, Aristotle was received into the church. Walter Ullman, by the way, I don't recommend on very much at all, um, certainly not on, on law. Um, in fact, uh, there's an academic I know at Cambridge um, who picked up the, the massive um, edition of the Roman law uh, from the university library. And the last person to take it out was, was Ullman. Hadn't been taken out since, many decades ago. And it had a little place mark in it, which, which was at something like page five. And yet Ullman managed to write hundreds and hundreds of pages about this stuff. Uh, and his poor acquaintance with it shows because how you can explain all of medieval thought um, in such grand sweeping terms, like ascending and descending theses of government is, is 
pretty um, it's pretty absurd. Um, now, since Augustine was one of the great creators and upholders of Christian orthodoxy, it may have been hoped that Aristotle would then serve as a, a basis to rephrase and refine Augustinian ideas. Um, now, when it came to this attempt at synthesis, um, Aquinas' attempt had some successes and some failures. Um, but I, I want to sort of look at some Augustinian, stereotypically Augustinian, because um, the Augustine that is in Aquinas is um, quite difficult to find at times, and when you do find it, it's often a, a blatant misrepresentation of Augustine. Um, and then I'll look at some uh, Aristotle in, in, in uh, Aquinas. Um, so to start with the Aristotelian ideas, actually, for one, man is a political animal with a nature. Man is a social and political animal, and this is because man, unlike animals in some respects, must come together with other men to realize his needs and his goals, and because man has the ability to, to discover right from wrong. Crucial to the presentation by Aquinas of the idea of man as social and political animal living in a community in multitudinae, in multitudinae vines, vivens rather, is the natural light of reason. Man has a nature, and above all, a nature which is not entirely corrupt or defective or impaired. And here Aquinas is following in the footsteps of William Auxer, who maintained that, quote, Adam was not made bereft of all his gifts, unquote. For Aquinas, man has, a re man has reason, unlike in the work of Augustine, and law exists in reason. In other words, law can be discovered and reasoned too, and it is objective and real in the sense that it was, um, as Aquinas writes in the Summa, the Summa Theologica, rather, um, inserted into the minds of men by God. We can argue in order to discover the law. Law is not arbitrary, even when it is given by a sovereign prince. For what pleases the prince has the force of law, as Ulpian would have had it, is true then only if, as Aquinas says in the summer, what pleases him is in accordance with some rule of reason. Thus, in the sense of the nature of man and the natural law, Aquinas is Aristotelian. He's also Aristotelian in the notion of, the, of a telos, or a purpose, for man and for society. Uh, because for him, men come together not only out of convenience, that they might live well, uh, in the sense alluded to above, i.e. that man's nature is different from that of animals and his needs cannot be satisfied by living in isolation and without society, but that they might live well in another different sense. For men, Aquinas writes in De Renio, in book one, they associate to live the good life, to live according to virtue. And therefore, quote, the end of human association is a virtuous life, unquote. Um, Furthermore, not only human society, but government in itself, as in Aristotelian political philosophy, should lead men to fulfill their end. Indeed, on politics, Aquinas is quite positive and a far cry from the essentially anti-political and fatalism um, of Augustine. In his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, Aquinas writes of political virtue as, quote, in itself good, unquote and says, quote, if it is informed by grace, it will be meritorious, unquote. The role of government, Aquinas tells us, in chapter 16 of book one, is to create the conditions in which men can flourish, and indeed to guide them to the realization of their purpose. Quote, to secure the good life for the community in such a way as to ensure that it has led to the ultimate end of blessedness. And I will come back to this which I'm sure you'll have noticed, um, this dual end. Um, the ultimate end of men is blessedness, um, but there is, if you like, an intermediate end, which can be achieved solely, naturally, solely in political society. And this is to be achieved um, by, quote, commanding those things which conduce to the blessedness of heaven and forbidding those which are contrary to it. As Aquinas takes after Aristotle on, the, on purpose or telos, he does too on the question of the related notion of the common good. Um, the law must be aimed at the common good, and for the law should not be directed towards the blessedness of an individual, as the argument goes in the summer, uh, 
quote, since every part of something is ordered in relation to the whole as imperfect to perfect, unquote, and therefore man being part of the community, part of a perfect whole, the law must seek to secure the common happiness. Uh, two further Aristotelian concepts jump out here. First, law, uh, and second, the perfect community. Uh, the following definition of law is advanced. Quote, a certain ordinance of reason for the common good made and promulgated by him who has the care of the community, unquote. And likewise, when Aristotle talks of the perfect community, this is most emphatically not Augustine's heavenly city. Instead, Aquinas talks of the perfect community in the Aristotelian sense of the state. All must be directed to the common good in this state, and there is no room for individual private ends. Law and the state are both presented as organic, uh, originating from the bottom up. There is a sense in which Aquinas's politics may be understood as one of Alban's famous, famous ascending theses of government, i.e. with power um, and authority flowing up from the bottom, from the people. Likewise, for Aquinas in De Renio, as for Aristotle, there is a lengthy description of the various kinds of government, such as polity, aristocracy, and monarchy, and democracy, oligarchy, and tyranny, with the key Aristotelian distinction between defective rule and effective rule maintained, that of the ruler or rulers either ruling in the interests of the community or ruling selfishly, uh, corruptly, degenerately, ruling for themselves. There are then clearly a number of Aristotelian political ideas in Aquinas. Augustinian political ideas in the political writings of Aquinas also feature. For instance, there's something clearly Augustinian in the surviving Neoplatonic elements of Aquinas, although there's not all that much. Aquinas is clear that the soul rules the body, and by implication, the distinction made between soul and body is still there. Aquinas is also essentially Augustinian on the importance of peace in society. And he defines peace in De Regno as, quote, the good and well-being of a community united in fellowship. Uh, this peace was to be maintained through the creation and preservation of unity. And it is thus that the consideration of the different kinds of government in De Regno can actually be read in an Augustinian light, since there is a distinction, there is a discussion rather, of how well these orders will preserve peace through unity. The conclusion of this discussion is that rule by a king is the best form of government, for there is not only the best, the most like, likelihood that he will fulfil this Aristotelian role of providing for the common good, but he will be unlikely to produce civil war. For societies with non-monarchical governments, quote, toil under dissensions and are tossed about without peace, unquote. Moreover, the risk of the king becoming a tyrant uh, is worth taking, since polities and aristocracies are likely to degenerate into civil strife in any case. Now, there is some ambiguity in Aquinas when it comes to how far you can resist and in what cases you can resist a tyrant. Um, on a certain reading, Aquinas is essentially Augustinian on passive obedience to tyrants. <coughs> the reason for the recommendation of passive obedience is twofold. Firstly, since the civil strife produced by rebellion against a tyrant may be imprudent, because it might disturb the peace and produce civil war, uh, or in any case a worse tyrant, but, but also there's another Augustinian notion which seems not to sit well with the earlier Aristotelian view of man's nature presented. Um, tyrannical rulers are also defended as a punishment for sin. The basis for this is mainly scriptural, with chapter and verse from Hosea and Job, both supporting the concept of an, un of an unjust ruler inflicted on a people as the wrath of God. Aquinas agrees this can be the case, though he tempers it with the suggestion that unjust rulers given to subjects in the wrath of God are resented and do not last long. Still, the notion of coercive power as a punishment for sin is still there, and it's at least implicitly applied to all rule and not just effective rule, since the objection that political authority is unnecessary and contrary to man's nature is rejected by Aquinas. There's also a pretty uh, 
um, stereotypically Neoplatonic body-soul dualism in the summer, when Aquinas explains that Christians must indeed submit to secular powers. Aquinas argues that secular power only pertains to the body and not the soul, which remains free. Since grace redeems souls and not bodies, we may serve the divine law in our minds and while not doing so with our bodies. Again, on the question of whether man is bound to serve the secular powers even though he is baptised, this is the case for Aquinas, since man is redeemed only from the spiritual servitude of sin and not from, quote, the corporeal servitude by which they are bound to serve temporal masters, unquote. These temporal masters must be motivated by the right things, and these motivations are not honour, power, riches or glory, which uh, are fleeting and which in any case are not achieved well by, um, uh, uh, achieved well by seeking them. But rather, it, again in an Augustinian fashion, the temporal master must be motivated by Christian caritas and by the heavenly reward that he will get by performing his duty. The, the synthesis then is, is there. There are elements there and there, there is an attempt at synthesis which may be seen primarily in um, an attempt to set up a dual, uh, a, a set of dual ends, um, which is, is rather problematic because, of course, um, there is, in, in Aquinas, there is the idea of, uh, of an ultimate end and an, in, an intermediate end, um, that is, of political society. Um, and, of course, that, that, that's when a lot of um, the, the whole Thomistic system, uh, at least politically, uh, breaks down. But I want to now move on to um, some later thinkers and show how around the 14th century you start to see rather interesting developments which um, make this kind of, which make the Thomistic system much clearer, which develop the system and make it, which provide a sort of stepping stone on the way to the uh, scholastic libertarianism with which you might be, might, might be familiar from the um, Counter-Reformation period. To do this, I want to contrast a couple of thinkers. One, of, one is Giles of Rome uh, and one is John of Paris. Uh, Giles of Rome in um, on ecclesiastical power and John of Paris in on royal and papal power respectively are excellent representatives of two common medieval approaches to politics or political thought. Giles of Rome may be seen to represent the so-called hierocratic approach in which all authority of all kinds belongs to God and is held by men only intermediately through the successes of St. Peter and though influenced by Thomas Aquinas, the Neoplatonic influence is also clear, possibly through Proclus. John of Paris, however, is very different indeed. He is clearly influenced much more by Aristotle and by St. Thomas. But John of Paris, just as nature and grace are of God, so kings and priests are of God. And the two have their own rules and their own legitimate spheres of interest. The two Giles of John, Giles and John, therefore differ enormously on questions of property and dominion. They differ on the goodness or otherwise of temporal things, of riches and goods. Giles of Rome is a particularly extreme hierocrat on his, in his line on property. The argument contains a number of parts and it's difficult to piece them together as a coherent whole because this particular text of Giles of Rome is is not particularly systematic. A right to property, to worthy possession of things, was conceived of as a divine grace. Following Augustine, hence a term that you will come across in the historiography of so-called political Augustinianism, which is, I think, based really on a misrepresentation of Augustine because he wasn't a particularly political thinker, but Giles argues that justice is the virtue which, quote, distributes to each what is due to him. And yet, uh, true justice is absent 
where founder and ruler of the Commonwealth is not Christ. We ought all to be under Christ. We are, in fact, sinners. We exist in, indeed, in a state of sin. As Augustine would say, we live in the cyclum. Quoting chapter and verse from Ephesians 2, we are, by nature, children of wrath. And then he quotes the heavily penitential Psalm 54, Behold, I was conceived in iniquities. And Giles concludes simply, we are not under our Lord. However, here a departure is made from Augustine proper, in that Giles then goes on to argue that since we are sinners, we cannot possess property. All property is rightly owned by the church, for we are made regenerate through the church and brought under Christ through the church. And since without, without Christ, under whose lordship is true justice, quote, you can have nothing justly, the church is the source of all property rights. Since the church reconciles sinners to God and not our carnal fathers, it is from the church that our possession derives, and hence through the receipt of divine grace, we become not heirs of merely, merely car uh, carnally begotten men, but, quote, the sons and heirs of God, even though the church does not oversee each case of a transfer of property. Indeed, the church is rather liberal on this um, interpretation, in fact, in that it allows the faithful their temporal lordship, their dominion, which is only, quote, a particular and inferior lordship, all the while the church reserves to itself the true universal lordship. So we have anything that we have on the suffrage of the church. This particular and inferior lordship is to be made possible through the sacraments of the church, specifically baptism and penance or confirmation, or rather confession, which are the remedies against original sin and actual sin. And through these two sacraments, one may be made a worthy lord and a worthy prince and possessor of things, unquote. However, it may be seen that there being the two kinds of sin, one original and one actual, there is, of course, room for the church to claw back property from any man should he fall into sin, since all hinges on the concept of the worthy possessor. Therefore, if any man falls into sin, specifically the turning away from God that results from mortal sin, even after spiritual regeneration through baptism and penance, <clears throat> Quote, it is right and just that he should be deprived of his property. Giles of Rome is also opposed to the notion of the goodness of property itself in any sense. Um, for Giles, the hierarchy of ends rules out any real goodness in the natural because the natural is subject to the supernatural. And for him, quote, it is the habit of divinity to lead the lower through to the higher by way of the intermediate, unquote. Temporal things, goods and riches, should not be sought as ends in themselves, but rather should be used if, quote, ordered towards spiritual ends, to attain the hope of blessedness. Ultimately, the Neoplatonist influence on Giles is important here. For the ultimate end concerns the soul, which is greater than the body, and the latter is subject to the former. The soul is within the remit of the church, but so are temporal things, since the possession of temporal things with their use in intermediate ends which may lead to the ultimate end is ultimately a spiritual matter therefore wrote giles the church must be involved in these matters since they quote bear upon the infirmity or health of souls unquote that i think is a very good summary of the classic hierocratic approach to the ownership of property which had been held by um by the vast majority of, of, um, of such thinkers who applied themselves to it throughout the medieval period. But through the reintroduction of Aristotle, you see something much, uh, much more amenable to a libertarian view of property. For John of Paris thought very differently about this. For John, the influence of Aristotle and Aquinas is much more apparent, and there is much more emphasis on the natural. John sets out to rebut the argument that the church is the true owner of all temporal things and spends a number of chapters doing it. For one, a distinction is made between lay property and ecclesiastical property. The Pope may have some lordship over ecclesiastical property, since this property is granted to the community as a whole, by which he means the church, 
Lay property, on the other hand, is not, and so we cannot argue by analogy from ecclesiastical to lay property. The property of laymen rather belongs within the human law, which is to follow the natural law, since man acquires property himself. And he is, and, um, and John of Paris is very clear about that. Property is acquired, quote, by individual people through their own skill, labour and diligence, and individuals, as individuals, have right and power over it and valid lordship, unquote. John uses Augustine to support him when he makes the point that, quote, it is the human laws which make property common or belong to individuals, unquote. Each man may therefore use his property as he sees fit, except in cases of necessity where the common good is in peril, or in, in, in which case the prince, in which case it is the prince and not the pope who is, intervene, who is to intervene, and the pope may simply grant indulgences to the faithful if they help during this time of necessity, and, quote, no power beyond this has been given to the pope, unquote. Moreover, there seems for John no reason grounded in the Christian faith to abandon or supersede the natural law. The arguments as put forward he rebuts one by one. Um, for instance, the arguments that Christ himself had jurisdiction over the property of laymen, such as the fact that Christ in Matthew 21 whipped the traders out of the temple in a manner that suggested he held authority over lay property, or that in Matthew 8 he sent demons into pigs without asking who owned them. These arguments are, quote, easily dismissed since he was acting as God, he was acting as God in such cases. <coughs> We, of course, are not God. For John, important to stress is that Christ's kingdom is not of this world and does not therefore concern, quote, judicial power over temporalities. Rather, during Christ's teaching mission on earth, he gave examples of virtue. Therefore, John concludes, since Christ as man had no dominion over temporalities, it is the case that, quote, no priest at all may claim to be Christ's vicar in this. Thus, John dealt with the priesthood, church, and Pope's claim to temporal lordship qua vicar of Christ. But what of the Pope as vicar of St. Peter? In this case, too, even if Christ, as man, had this power, he did not hand it on to St. Peter. Indeed, John is extraordinarily bold in downplaying the primacy of Peter among the apostles when he points out not only that all apostles received the binding and loosing powers in Matthew 18, uh, the, the apostles received this power and honour from Christ and shared an equal fellowship with Peter. Since no one claims that the remaining bishops of the church, aside from the Bishop of Rome, insofar as they are successors of the other apostles, have the dominion claimed so frequently for the Pope. Furthermore, John invokes and quotes Bernard of Clairvaux to Pope Eugenius when he writes... Quote, this is the apostolic model. Lordship is forbidden, service is commanded. And so John concludes, quote, no one should claim that the Pope has such powers on a universal scale. For John of Paris to argue that the Church or the Pope, as head of the Church on earth, has such dominion, is to misunderstand what the Church is. The Church for John is a purely spiritual thing, and its priests have been given the power by Christ to dispense the sacraments to the faithful, and this is all. The church's mission and purpose is a universal one and can be carried out by the immaterial spiritual sword. For Giles of Rome, things are radically different, and they were radically different for most thinkers before John of Paris and uh, the first wave of scholastics. For Giles of Rome, quote, the church can act against secular princes because the temporal sword is placed under the spiritual sword. Giles and John then disagree fundamentally on much more than lay property because they have radically different ecclesiologies. Another question on which the two disagree is that of who comes first, kings or priests, both in terms of primacy or superiority and chronologically. For Giles of Rome, the answer is clear. Priests come first in primacy and also in chronology. They instituted kings. Not only is it clear that the church and the priesthood are higher in dignity on earth, but their power is greater and they came first, with scriptural examples given such as that of Saul and Melchizedek. Uh, 
Kingdoms which do not owe their existence to priests, such as Babylon, are not kingdoms but, quote, bands of robbers. Moreover, from a Neoplatonic argument that inferior bodies are under superior bodies, the analogy is made between secular power and spiritual power, and the conclusion made that if the secular power wrongs, quote, it will be judged by the spiritual power as its superior. For John of Paris, however, kings come first chronologically, simply as a matter of historical fact. And here it's important to think not just in terms of kings, but in terms of human society itself. Since there were human societies before Christ, but, quote, there is no comparison and there is no hierarchy as with Giles. Priests and kings both exist, but in parallel. Priests are spiritual, kings are natural. Therefore, for John, Giles' arguments about the superiority or, pre uh, or precedence of priests over kings makes little sense, for the two operate in different realms. While John is willing to grant that the priestly role is perhaps more dignified than that of a king, this does not make priests superior to kings. Instead, the king is superior qua king and the priest superior qua priest. The temporal power is more powerful, more dignified, etc., in temporal matters, while the spiritual power is greater in spiritual matters. A closely related question is that of the very purpose of human society and any governmental arrangements themselves, and it is also one on which Giles and John differ. For the question of superiority or primacy is connected with that of the purposes of the secular and spiritual powers. For Giles, again, there is a hier the hierarchy of ends, with the ultimate end, the end of blessedness. For this reason, all must be subject to the Pope ultimately, since the task of secular princes is to, quote, dispose and prepare material for the ruler of the church. Therefore, the secular powers concerned with mere intermediate ends must naturally be, quote, subject to him to whom pertains the care of the ultimate end, unquote. For John of Paris, there is both the natural and the supernatural. There is nature and grace, the spiritual and the temporal. Dominion falls into the sphere of the natural and is to be judged in such terms. Therefore, in Aristotelian or Thomistic fashion, John, who, like Aquinas, defines man as a social and political animal, puts forward a clear sense of the ability of the secular powers to create the conditions for human flourishing. The purpose of government is most certainly not a spiritual one. Instead, the purpose of the secular powers is, quote, the common good of the citizens, not any good indeterminately, but that good which is to live according to virtue. Furthermore, this kind of moral virtue is not necessarily Christian virtue. For John, it's clear that this virtue may be regarded as, quote, complete without theological virtues. Thus, it is that the purpose of the secular powers differs from that of the church. One is natural, one is supernatural. Any direction the Pope may give to the king is in matters of faith, but not in government. Pope and king have different purposes and must work in different ways, since governments are relative and particular, while the church is universal. The precise workings of government therefore vary from place to place, since, the concern, since they concern the unchanging reality of the world while the, since they, they concern the changing reality of the world, while the church concerns the unchanging and the eternal. The effect of this argument is to heavily circumscribe any lordship claimed by the Pope. Another point of divergence is on the question, where does authority come from? The two men naturally agree that all power comes from God. The divergence begins with from where the secular powers receive their authority. For Giles of Rome, all power is given by Christ to the successors of St. Peter, not just the power of the keys, but all earthly dominion. The Pope has plenitude of power, and this is true of each Pope, since he is individual since each Pope is individually the successor of St. Peter, not of his immediate predecessor. For John of Paris, however, quote, the spiritual and temporal powers are distinct to the extent that one power is not reduced to dependence on the other, but just as the spiritual derives immediately from God, so does the temporal. Again, John does not think in terms of hierarchies or precedents, nor does he compare kings and priests, temporal and spiritual. Both temporal and spiritual derive their authority immediately from God. 
Thus, kings are kings, not through the mediation of the Pope or the Church, but directly through the manner of their becoming kings, whether by election or through creation by the army or through feudal custom or whatever it might be. John applies his bottom-up approach to the papacy too, since the Pope is Pope because of the consent of the Church or those representing it. And therefore, he argues that the Church, through a general council or the College of Cardinals, quote, might conversely unmake him. For John then, far from Giles of Rome's contention that the Pope has plenitude of power and is the Church, Popes have no special uh, temporal power. The approach then that was made by John of Paris is, I think, I think very clearly foreshadows the approach that you can see later with the Counter-Reformation Jesuits and Dominicans from Iberia. What John of Paris is doing is he is developing the Thomistic system and he is more clearly, more clearly separating the, the duality, the, the, the two ends of Aquinas, the intermediate and the ultimate. He is more clearly separating the spiritual and the temporal. Now, to step back there, then from that and think about some um, significance that that might have in the medieval period, you've got to bear in mind that since the 9th century, popes had been, um, pope, popes had been anointing and crowning Holy Roman emperors. I was talking a lot then about the pope, but I might well... I might easily have spoken about the Western Emperor um, because the the way in the way that uh, the medievals thought, to the extent that you can talk about commonalities in medieval thought about Europe was um, Christendom, and the way they thought about lordship um, ultimately was um, they they would think ultimately about. A dominus mundi, whether that was the Pope or the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor or both. Um, and while I do still refer to the, um, the the medieval period, or at least much of it, as some kind of ordered anarchy, in which there were interlocking spheres of uh, in, interlocking uh, jurisdictions, overlapping systems of law. Um, to the effect that um, where there was the hierarchies weren't terribly hierarchical and uh, tyranny was actually relatively compared to nowadays um, anarchy um, and while monarchs um, were certainly uh, not at the stage of being um, the uh, sole rulers of um, territorially sovereign areas with great bureaucracies um, What's interesting to see is that th th there's, there's a kind of paradox in medieval uh, political thought, whereas the earlier you go, the less it seems to represent the, uh, the sort of um, anarchic nature of the medieval period. The earlier you go, the more you get theocratic um, uh, political thought, the, more, the less you get um, any kind of political thought that would um, that would make sense of what was actually happening on the ground um, and it takes it takes the reintroduction it takes the it takes the conflict between between church and empire it takes the breakdown of the unity of Christendom into nations um, it takes the development of Roman and canon law uh, but also, I would say, the reintroduction of Aristotle to create some kind of um, what, some kind of political philosophy, which uh, can then lead on to the systems of thought that we see with the with the Second Scholastics. But um, I'm I'm conscious of the fact that I'm I'm now trying to fill time, and I'll, I'll answer any questions at all that might Thank come you, up. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any questions? Well, Aristotle, of course, is supposed to be a libertarian of some sort. 
Uh, Ayn Rand, of course, thought he was. But, but, but there's also the... Uh, yeah, he's dead. He's been dead for some time. Uh, also, there is still living... There is still living, John, I believe, Jonathan Barnes, who's the author of Aristotle in the, the called Past Masters, who is an anarcho-liberal. The, uh, uh, so presumably Aristotle is a, has some liberalism to him. Uh, is there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, not, not, nice speech. Um, <laughs> let me um, let, let's come to that quote from Augustine: "What without justice <laughs> is a state but a gang of thieves writ large?" Now that sounds a, a very liberal, indeed a libertarian statement. It, it's just that um, if you look at what. Augustine meant by justice, it may not have been terribly libertarian mm. because he allowed the state the right to control the opinions of its subjects. Mm. Yeah, no, no, one, no one can really agree what Augustine thought. No. And um, it's because he contradicts himself, it's because he's, he's not got a very clear writing style. Uh, he, he's. Mm, where. where um, if if um, Edmund Burke's 1757, I think, when, it, when did he write his essay on the sublime and the beautiful? One of the early ones. Uh, I imagine uh, around the, there. This day, day About me. there. I mean, if if that can be applied to thought, then you know, Aquinas is Aquinas is beautiful. Aquinas is quite pretty and so on. But mm. Augustine is sublime. But he's sublime because the, the reaction that he produces is, um, it's not terribly intellectual, it's emotional. Um, and I think it's very difficult to produce any kind of coherent political philosophy out of Augustine, um, despite the fact that there is this term, political Augustinianism, which no one can really define, despite the fact that it's, it's used so often. I think what it really... Um, I think what most people would take it to mean is sort of reform papacy stuff. Um, Gregory the Seventh onwards. I mean, I mean, you, you can to go back to this to the temporal and the spiritual. Um, uh, there are sort of three ways of of looking at the temporal and the spiritual throughout the uh, the the, uh, the Middle Ages. One is uh, church everything, and that's sort of that's um, Gregory the Seventh. Um, uh, reform papacy, so-called political Augustinianism. Um, church controls everything. Uh, you must have uh, Pope as Dominus Mundi. Um, the other thing is the complete reverse, which comes in quite late. It's only, well, it's only articulated, well, quite late, with Ockham, uh, Marsilius of Padua, and so on, which is um, that the church must be completely subject to secular powers. In the middle, though, you've got quite a, a wide range of, of, of stuff, um, and uh, Aquinas and um, Aquinas would probably fit quite well there. Um, but you know, the, the band of robbers thing is very difficult to interpret um, because it's it comes quite early in the text, I think. Book four, yeah. Um, and book four is not a terribly important book, as I remember it. Um, all the important stuff happens in book nineteen. Um, and I'm, I'm, the, you know, it's, it's all really bound up with questions like, um, uh, for instance, how can a, why should the just man be involved in government or how should he be involved in government? Um, and the, the only answer that you ever get from Augustine is, is Christian Caritas. Because he doesn't have a separate, he doesn't have a separate naturalistic way of looking at government um, or anything. Um, everything is ev everything is spiritual. The only things that matter are the spiritual. The only virtues are theological. Um, and so, I mean, that hence why it doesn't really make much sense to talk of Augustine having a philosophy. Um, he is just theology, um, and that the band of robbers remark is, is, is something that has been misquoted. Um, I see it misquoted by 
various libertarian blogs every now and then. And it just quotes on its own, it looks quite nice. It looks like Augustine the Libertarian, but, but nothing could be further from the truth, really. Um, well, um, how much do these chaps look abroad, as it were, to non-Christian parts of the world? Could they not see the importance simply of um, property acknowledged by others and the liberty to work it and the liberty to exchange produce? Did they ever come as? Could they not leave God out of it for long enough to um hmm. to, to explain why these people would seem to do quite well? Um, they were obviously trading with the Middle East and the East. Yeah, well, was, uh, something I should have I should have mentioned is um, another great a great virtue of um, the reintroduction of Aristotle onwards. The um, with let's take both Aquinas and, and John of Paris as they. Uh, they they admit that heathens, uh, Muslims, uh, ap- even no, not perhaps not apostates, Aquinas no, no, not apostates, John of Paris probably apostates. Um, they can own property just like any other man, um, because you, you're starting to get a very clear separation of the temporal and the spiritual, um, and because they're they're realizing that. Um, you're, you're, you're gradually, it, it is basically a halfway point between the the early medieval stuff and uh, people like Francisco Suarez. Francisco Suarez says the natural law is completely independent of God's will. Um, and so it's, it's really a, a stepping stone on the way to that, but uh, uh, Aquinas would be fine with, with, um, with, with Muslim rulers. Um, the uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Plato famously said that uh, the ethical was separate from theology. And if God exists, which Plato thought he did, the question would arise whether God is good or bad. And most uh, theologians know about this because most theologians uh, read Plato. Uh, and you know, the, the Plato uh, poses this question. So there is a separate... You know, most celebratedly pointed out in might does not make right and cannot make right. Might is one thing, right is another. And this is a celebrated thing all, all down from Plato onwards. You know, this, this theology is quite separate from ethics. Yeah, the, 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 damage, to, the damage to political thought is done not, not by Plato proper, I suppose, but by, but by Neoplatonism, by essentially finding the insertion points and inserting Christian theology into into Plato. Plato on his own, um, well, Plato on his own is not terribly pleasant reading either. Um, uh, but I, 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 I'm always told I'm very un- unenlightened when I say that. Uh, but my own, my own reaction, if ever I read any Plato, I was terrified. No, you don't like it. Oh, gosh, no. Dialogue's quite jolly, I think. I mean, there's lots of uh, <laughs> lots of fascist ideas in there, so on, as, as Russell and Papa and people like that point <clears> out. <throat> but... Uh, Would I be right in thinking that your basic view is that there's a distinction between a theocracy and a democracy? Well, that's what I was trying to get at. Because if that's the case, I, I would actually take a lot of issue with it, because... If we look at, say, the situation with regard to Henry VIII, he requested two annulments of the Catholic Church, one after the other. The Pope admitted one, but refused the second. Now, one way of looking back on it is the breach between the UK and Rome was basically a question of inheritance and legacy and who was going to actually... um, have a male heir to the throne. But in actual fact, the second interpretation is perfectly valid, and to me, actually quite realistic, which is that King Henry VIII's family was very poor. He went up to Wolsey's Hampton Court, and when he saw that, and how rich it was, he realized, as did Cromwell, how rich the church had become. They owned nearly 80% of London. Now, <coughs> The view going back on history is that Cromwell wanted Henry VIII to do the annulment 
because it gave them a pretext to nationalize all the church property. So basically, it's not about secular and non-secular. It's about money. And it's always been about money. And Rome has always been in competition with monarchies for the control of Europe. And I just don't see the separation between the two, except in possibly a church and a service and a hymn and a prayer. Practical purposes, there's no difference. It's a pragmatic political decision on both parts. Mm. There's no separation. You can see this in Saudi Arabia now. They're going through exactly what we went through in the 15th and 16th century. They've got the Wahhabis on the one side, the royal family on the other, and they're in conflict as to who is in control of that country. The Wahhabis feel that basically they've been betrayed because they were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the country, and the royal family have interfered in that by various reforms. The royal family feel that basically because the church has supported jihadists, that it's taking a political role. Now, <clears throat> in about 300 years, Saudi Arabia will be a democracy, <laughs> just as it took us the same amount of time. <clears throat> but you have a modern laboratory now where we have a country in the 21st century sitting in a medieval situation where you have a theocracy on one side and a monarchy on the other, and they're both corrupt. And it's all about money. It's about who controls that oil wealth, who controls that gas field. And I, I just don't see this separation mm. between secular and non-secular. Mm. It, it really doesn't it just <coughs> register at all. Mm. I think that we're... I think we're, in modern times, we've actually grown up in Europe, where the Middle East has yet to catch up, is that the church now has taken over a role which the state has pretty much distanced itself from, which is basically social welfare. You can see the church involving itself in various charities overseas. You can see it involving itself in night shelters. You can see it involving itself like the Red Cross uh, in hospitals. And that's, that's what I see the present now. And if we go back to the medieval period, we can take that abstraction view, but it's very <coughs> artificial. I don't believe the nature of people have changed since the 15th century. If we go back to Marlow, the time of Marlow, 1596, Marlow's sitting in Deptford under house arrest. There's loads of migrants coming over from Europe, Protestants. There's an anti-migrant feeling and sentiment inside the UK against all these migrants coming in. Now the Crown and the politicians and the courtiers, they all want those migrants in because they're bringing money with them and they're pushing up property rents. And ditto, look how common it is today, the same situation. Free movement of people means rents go up, wages go down. And back in the 15th, 16th century, they had the same problem. Mm. And, and the church, now when Thomas More, I remember seeing the first film by um, David Lean, mm. Thomas More, and I thought, what an amazing man. And then I actually grew up. <laughs> I actually realised how bad Thomas More was, because if you read his biography, he had a house down in Chelsea, which was more or less a farm, and he had a barn full of food. And when the peasants ran out of food, they came to that barn and they said, we want that food. And Thomas More refused. Now, Thomas More was a Catholic before he was a patriot and a, a, a sort of advisor to the monarchy. And the result of making the wrong choice was his head ended up on a spike. Mm. But he was trapped because he couldn't find a legal way of sitting on the fence between the secular and the non-secular. And that's the problem. If you don't take sides, people will push you onto one side or the other. So I don't believe in this abstraction between secular and non-secular at all. Mm. Church has always said to monarchy, we will support you and say you rule by divine right. The monarchy has always said, we rule by divine right because the church supports us. It's been a, a partnership and a wedding made in hell. Mm. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Nothing new in church, but I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, consider it not possible you've been mistaken. Like no, it, there's some stuff I agree with, some stuff I don't, but um, I, I, was princi- I was principally talking about the abstract and principally talking about um, thought and not so much about, um, about who did what and when. Um, because what, what is interesting is, I think I, I said earlier, oh, thank you, that um, when... Um, what's interesting in, in medieval political thought is the more is, is libertarian yeah, libertarian ish um, ways of thinking come about when the uh, when the, the, the political order is least libertarian. Uh, it's much like um, and it's much like you see grand um, expressions of liberties and freedoms in charters and so on when they're most under threat. Um, and so, uh, I, I've, yeah, I, I don't doubt that some people have been uh, insincere um, uh, sometimes. And, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, dismiss um, the, f- for instance, as much as I think this, has been, that, that this was a very um, illiberal and unlibertarian way of thinking, I wouldn't dismiss the uh, hierocratic view of um, of government as simply uh, about power. Uh, you do have to make some room for sincerely held theological uh, beliefs, especially back then, um, when that that sort of stuff mattered much more, or um, people felt it mattered much more than they feel it does now. But yeah. Bob? Uh, Queen Elizabeth, she um, did not peer through the windows into each, each, each soul, so it was almost, keep it to yourself, don't rock the boat, and yeah. you're allowed to be a bit this and a bit that. Tolerated Bird, who was a Catholic, uh, in, in, in the middle of the uh, Westminster uh, music. Uh, oh yes, but he wrote such nice mass settings. Yeah. Well, it's not anyone. It's not him. And much, much else besides. Yeah. Oh, some could get away with it, yes. So give, it, give it to yourself. Anyone else you have to leave? Yeah, no, actually, yeah, I wonder if you, if you could just clarify two points of the book. Uh, I'm St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustine. The, 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 they were renowned. Or uh, this is what the argument used to go in. I remember in the 1970s when we were arguing with the feminists who were on the march then, <laughs> that they were very pro prostitution, those two, those two saints, in their theology. And just to quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. Imperial practice. St. Thomas Aquinas, he actually said, if you do not allow this, what you get is something much worse. And that's a direct quote. Did he really? Augustine used to use prostitutes. Now, we that's that's used perfectly correct. Push, we used to quote that to the feminists in the, in the 1970s. <laughs> Did it go down well? Yes. <laughs> um, the, 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 same, the same kind of stuff has come up with after the um, Re- Reformation. Mm. John Calvin, the predestination. So he, he used to... Um, he, he would more or less come to the same conclusion, but by a different means. <laughs> but when you have a look with the new wave feminism, for example, um, the Nor- Nordic, the Nordic model of feminism, <laughs> that's in direct contrast to that. And I just wonder how you feel about those the two ideas like of talking about libertarians <laughs> and uh, these models today and these old models of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine. I mean, h- how would you square those two? <laughs> <laughs> With difficulty. <laughs> Would you say they're more libertarian? I'm going to be You've asked the question. Well, no, no way for the answer. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, here we are. Master. I'm going to be packed. You've asked the question. No way for the answer. Have you got the quotation? Augustine used to use prostitutes. Gosh. Gosh. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good question. 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 I think it's a
hypocrisy masquerading as political correctness. Absolutely. And basically, nobody wants to say anything now of, of exactly what their opinion or their statement. Well, nobody, because they'll be identified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because without, they'll be identified. He's taking it all yeah. on himself. Without actually getting censored for it. And I think that um, the problem we've got today is that uh, we're getting more and more censored, you know? And so. in a sense, he's right. Back in, back in that time, we had more freedom of speech than we do today. I mean, it's like you, you tell me whether that's the case or not. It's a very difficult comparison to make. Um, nowadays, you can, anyone can just go on the internet and, and write whatever they like. Well, that's um, not true. No, no, you, yeah, you, that's I, not true. On a personal note, I'm very interested in mental health, and I always say, I, and my view is quite radical. I always say I would like them all sacked. Right. I'd like psychiatrists, social workers, you name it, and not replaced. Right. I think they're part of the problem. But people won't take, even take it seriously me saying this. As soon as they uh, start saying this with, with good mm. reason, you can see they don't even want to contemplate that there may be some sense in it. Right. Yeah, really, you, it, it's closed. You know, some discourse is is, is closed. Exactly. It won't even be considered. Yes, you, you're the worst of. Hang on a bit. Hang on a bit. Hang on a bit. Dominic. Dominic. Let's 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 try to keep, keep some sort of discussion here. Uh, 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 of course, you can get uh, books on the myth of mental illness by Sats, and they you can you know, go from there. But but. Uh, have you got anything more to say on this? No, uh, of prostitutes? nothing more. I mean, Augustine used to use prostitutes, but uh, that's, that's true. Yeah. We paid them, I hope. Of course, you paid them. Well, they were using him as well. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there any more questions? I'm, I'm not laughing at what you're saying, Pat. I'm not laughing at the. Uh, is there any questions? Every subject. No. Every subject. Yeah, any more questions? This is a forum. You have a certain talent. I think we can thank the speaker. I will give you that. All right. Right. There's no more questions. So, all right then. I think we can thank the speaker for giving us good talk. Thank you very much indeed.